War Memorial in the castle, is that that too is both a commemoration and a celebration. A commemoration of the dead, absolutely, but a celebration of a Scottish national identity, um, something, of course, which in 2014 uh, is particularly worth reflecting on. Um, and the same point, of course, can be made about other war memorials created elsewhere. If you've ever been to Canberra, the Australian War Memorial is both a celebration of Australian national identity, of its emergence uh, from under British rule, if you like, from being part of the empire to being an independent country, as well as a commemoration of those who were killed. Hay wrote in his book uh, on the War Memorial, which was essentially a guidebook, that by the late 1920s, and these are his words, Armistice Day ceased to exist as a restaurant orgy. Restaurant orgy, is that your idea of remembering something? Um, Armistice Day ceased to exist as a restaurant orgy. The two minute silence took its place. So commemoration uh, had triumphed. And with that silence, albeit a silence with an echo as it reverberated on the stone memorial scattered throughout the world, the First World War began to uh, 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 acquire the connotations of waste and futility that have been its dominant theme really ever since. Um, this is something that took place round about 1928 uh, and round about the 10th anniversary of the end of the war. One of the points I think we want to reflect on as we get closer to that centenary, we aren't there yet for all the fact that there's so much going on already, uh, not only manifested by your presence here this evening, but also uh, by television. One of the things that I think we want to think about is that how we look at this war depends on where we are as opposed to where they were. In other words, how the First World War was looked at in 1928 wasn't necessarily how it was looked at even in 1918. And how it was looked at in 1928 had an enormously important part in shaping how we look at it now. The most important feature of that is the publication of a book in Germany, uh, Investen Lix Neues, uh, in the English title, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, published in serial form in a German newspaper, and then as a book in early 1929, and almost immediately published in a vast range of languages, it became an international success, um, and then, uh, most importantly, made into a film um, as the first uh, talkie that ever won an Oscar. Um, the, uh, the bad news for Louis Milestone, who was, who was producing it, uh, he decided initially to make it as a silent film, and then, of course, he realized that silent films had had their day and had to scrap the work he'd done and start again. Uh, but significantly, the story derived from a German novel about German soldiers on the Western Front, in which not a single American appears, except as an actor, of course, um, made in the United States and Hollywood, <coughs> and it wins an Oscar. Um, it was, as I said, an international phenomenon. But what it did was consolidate a certain set of ideas which have been with us ever since. Uh, a set of ideas uh, which Remark himself disowned wanting to establish. Uh, there's a remarkable exchange of letters uh, between Ian Hamilton, General Sir Ian Hamilton, uh, Gordon Hamilton, of course, I think it's Gordon, uh, who had commanded the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force of Gallipoli. Um, and Hamilton read All Quiet on the Western Front, and he wrote to Remark's publisher to congratulate him on the book. And Remark, very modestly, what Hamilton said, here's a you know, full general, uh, senior officer, British officer, writing to tell him what a wonderful book it is, saying this is the book that captures the war. And Remark uh, very modestly wrote back and said, it's too soon to write the history of this war or to understand it. Uh, the same point about competing narratives. It's not for another 100 years that we will know how to judge this war and how to understand it. Um, that didn't stop people, hasn't stopped people ever since taking all quiet on the Western Front as an embodiment of this war. It's worth just remembering, I think, two important things. The first is that Remark himself, although he served in the German army, uh, never served at the front. Uh, he was wounded in 1918, 
by the German, the British raid that got rather further into the uh, into the um, into the uh, German positions than it had been anticipated. Uh, but he himself apparently never served in the front line. And the other thing I would say, and this is the point about the e published in 1928, is that what it reflected was the experience of those who had come back from the war and who had then struggled to find their place in their home countries when they had returned. It's as much about the generation who had fought and what they did after the war as it is about the war itself. And Remark makes that point repeatedly through, through the book, and he followed it up with a book called The Road Back, which addresses exactly those issues. If you take, if you've read the book, you'll know it begins in the school classroom, and Paul Baum of the heroes inspired by his teacher to go off and fight. So it takes, essentially, a teenager, sends him off to the war, makes him into a soldier. In the novel, of course, Baum was killed, but he returns from the war, or Remark returns from the war, and then what happens? Because by then you've become a soldier. You've moved from adulthood, or from adolescence to adulthood, and become a soldier on the way. And many people, of course, in the 1920s find it very hard to find a fresh sense of direction. Uh, the problem for many veterans was that they had gone through the most important and profound experience of their lives. And I'm sure some of you who have spoken to First World War veterans, and they <coughs> constantly came back to it. When Evan Blunden, uh, uh, the wife of Evan Blunden, when Evan Blunden died, who wrote the great of the Thames of War, another book published at exactly the same time, the 10th anniversary of the end of the war, uh, he, 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 um, when he died, his widow, Claire Blunden, was asked uh, for her memories of her husband. And she said, there is never a day, there never was a day, when he did not refer to that war. He lived to the 1970s. There was never a day when he did not refer to that war. I have to say, I used to tell that story to my wife. My wife said, I know how she felt. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, if the 1928-29 centenary, sorry, 10th anniversary, had a role uh, in shaping how we see this war, um, even more, I think, we live with the legacy of 1964, uh, of what happened uh, in that anniversary. Because in 1964, the 50th anniversary of the war's outbreak, uh, many of the veterans, of course, of the First World War, including Edward Blunder and Remark, were both still alive. It's worth remembering just how many people were still alive. Of those who put on uniform in the First World War, in the British Armed Forces, 88% came home. So most people who served in this war, as far as this country is concerned, lived to tell the tale. It doesn't mean they weren't wounded, doesn't mean they didn't have terrible experiences, and it doesn't mean that there weren't certain units that had much higher levels of loss of life than that. But they came home. And they had, if they were prepared to talk, many of you will know, of course, they were not people they were prepared to talk, um, they had the capacity to shape that memory. And in 1964, of course, they were filmed for the Great War series, the BBC series, which itself was a pioneering historical documentary. There had been nothing like it before on British television. I have to say, in terms of production values, there's been nothing like it since either, uh, because one of the assumptions that they made when they were making that documentary is that Germans should always come from the east and therefore, when you look to television, they should attack from right to left. And the British come from the west, therefore they must always go from left to right. It makes for an awful lot of left-handed Germans. Um, <laughs> but the BBC is going to show it again, so you'll get an opportunity to see it. And one of the attractions, you've not seen it, and one of the attractions in it is that these veterans speak. Um, you will hear them talk about their experiences of the war. Very powerful. But also, of course, a moment when this was a war which was marked as a war of futility. Um, oh, what a lovely war, Jamie Littlewood's production. Wonderful production. I had the great privilege, I think, as a, a teenager myself, seeing it in, in the Edinburgh Festival, in, 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 the, um, in the Assembly Hall, uh, on the open stage, <coughs> Victor Spinetti's impression of 
uh, a drill sergeant doing banners instruction. It's one of the great moments of theatre, comic theatre. Um, so anybody who does a subsequent uh, performance really has to live up to that in my, in my mind. But what we need to remember, again, is this point of how do people judge it in terms of their experience in 1964. And you need to remember that 1964, this country, felt itself to be very close to the dangers of another major war. The Cuban Missile Crisis had happened two years before, in 1962. Um, there was a real sense that we had been on the brink and we had come back from something far more cataclysmic than the First World War was. And so the notion that this war was futile and wasteful absolutely paid in, played into the narrative of 1964. Because the whole purpose of thinking about war was indeed to prevent it happening, to make sure that the, the last war really was the last war, to prevent it. How we see war in 2014 is different from how we saw it in 1964, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. There is, I think, a challenge which the legacy of 1964 leaves us with, and it's this. And that is, if we are to take that legacy, to take, for example, the arguments of people like Alan Clark in his book The Donkeys, or Liam Wolfe in Flanders Fields, two books that both had a big impact um, in that era, that this was a war that should not have been fought and was fought in ways that were unacceptable, then how do we actually commemorate in a way that honors those who gave their lives? Can we honor the dead and dishonor the causes for which they fought and the way in which they fought? I think one can, but I think we don't often think hard enough about it. And let me just illustrate the point by looking at one particular source, which I think raises this particular problems for us. And that is the last letters written home by those who served. Those missives which were penned before a big offensive and were meant to be sent to mothers, fathers, family members, wives, only the event of the death of the person who had written them. And the challenge here is, of course, nobody writing a letter in those circumstances, knowing that he is going to an attack the following day, will write to his mother or to his wife, saying, my life has been wasted. Or he's very unlikely to do so. Because, of course, he has to think of the effect of the letter on the person whom he loves. And therefore, of course, he will tend to say, upbeat things. I'm dying in a good cause. I'm dying. My death has not been attained. Uh, but, and at the same time, of course, the recipient of that letter has, wants to hear that, wants to hear that the death has not been attained. If your husband or son was killed, of course you wanted to have a sense that he had died for something that was worth fighting for. Um, at the same time, just think of the circumstances. The night before a big attack, you're writing your last letter to somebody you love dearly. Are you actually going to write something you don't believe? Are you going to write something that is completely untrue? And that also seems to me to be hard to comprehend. Surely, if you think you're confronting your death, that at, of all times, is the time when you're going to be honest. Um, and so I think we have to take these sources seriously. We have to listen to what they say. And I want to read one or two to you, which are not British, just to make a point that we're not just talking about a British war. The first is from a French naval lieutenant, uh, Pierre uh, Dubier, uh, who died at Newport um, on the, the, the Channel Coast. Um, on the Isère, uh, air, in, just inside Belgium, on the 3rd of April, 1915. Well, he died after the day after the 4th of April. And he wrote to his wife uh, of how much he missed her and loved her. And then he went on. But I quickly reject these thoughts, which are so terribly distressing. 
I think of our dear France, which must be saved. I think of this country with enthusiasm, with generosity, and also, in spite of all, with faithfulness and obedience. Another Frenchman, Pierre Maurice uh, Massard, uh, killed in April 1916, wrote to his wife from Verdun um, at 2 a.m. on the 29th of February 1916, so a couple of months before he died. In this sacrifice which we accept, we feel everything that is big and moving, and we no longer dare to think of our little interests and our small pleasures, given that it is the destiny of France itself which is at stake. Nationally and globally, it is such a big role we have to play. Let God be with us. Now, of course, France, unlike Britain, had been invaded. For France, this was a war of national self-defense. For France, there was an issue of recovering territory that was under German military rule, and a rule whose brutality, even if it does not compare with the brutality of Nazi occupation in the Second World War, still seemed to be appalling to those who witnessed it at the time. In those cities which had been occupied by the Germans during the course of the First World War, the liberation of 1918 was greeted with scenes that can only be described as ecstatic, with indeed celebration. After the armistice, King Albert of the Belgians uh, returned to his capital, Brussels, after four years, uh, and people crowded in the streets uh, and, of course, celebrated the moment when Belgium once again became essentially an independent country. In Alsace-Lorraine, which of course had been under German occupation since the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, French soldiers returned after nearly 50 years. As one of them wrote, what emotion, but also what joy, what bliss. Long before the time, the young girls adorned with ribbons and the colors of France came to meet us with flowers, and much to our surprise, we found the whole town bedecked with flags. The former mayor, with great white beard, cried tears of joy. Veterans of 1870 held out their hands to take ours. I was so moved that I could not speak. In the afternoon, our band gave a concert. The old mayor asked the bandmaster for his baton and conducted the Marseillaise with masterly skill and full of emotion. France and Belgium celebrated victory as well as commemorated their losses. And next time you go to France, look at the war memorials in the villages. Because, of course, in France, they tend to be, they are secular, not sacred, they're not in churchyards, they're not in churches, they're in the town square, they're in the Grand Place. Uh, what do they show? They show soldiers, nearly always a poilu, with his helmet on, but above him also very often, the winged figure of victory can be seen as an angel, but here they always look closely, and it is victory. Moreover, that celebration was also to be found in Eastern Europe and among nations that had ostensibly been defeated. In particular, the shattering of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918 left in its train independent states who, when 2018 comes, will commemorate and celebrate their centenaries. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary uh, are obvious cases in point. And of course, they have had a checkered history, many of them since, but they will still go back to 1918 as the moment when they became modern and recognizably identifiable states. Um, one of them, of course, might be Ukraine. Um, and that is exactly the point as to why this war continues to have purchase for us today. Ukraine, after the Russian Revolution um, and the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk uh, in 1918, was briefly an independent country, independent of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, of course, in that case, it was a false dawn. But that does not deny the fact that the First World War spelt the end of empires and the apparent triumph of the notion of national self-determination. And I think that is the challenge for us as we approach 2014. We tend still to see the First World War in national terms. Our challenge, I think, as we come to the centenary 
um, is that we see this war so much in terms of what happened to Britain. We argue about it in terms of British generalship, uh, the issue of whether Hay is a competent general uh, or a butcher.